Talk of war. everyone thank you for for our so our first speaker is Stephanie Whirl who is a thoracic surgeon where she's also the thoracic section chief thank you. all right hi welcome so very exciting time to be talking about esophageal cancer. You know, a lot's changed. It's really within the last decade now, GI doctors are doing a lot of the care for esophageal cancer. Um, we're doing a lot of different things, a lot of immunotherapy now. So I'm gonna talk about minimally invasive esophagectomy, which I think will be the standard of care soon. Uh, we just need to get people there. Um, so when you say minimally invasive esophagectomy, it has a lot of different definitions. So it can mean hybrid, meaning laparoscopic and thoracotomy, and that's what we saw in that New England Journal of Medicine publication, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, a lot of people mean a laparoscopic VAS approach, so like the classic um, MIE Ivor Lewis. And then some people are doing laparoscopic transhiatal. I'm doing totally robotic, and all of these are minimally invasive esophagectomies. So minimally invasive esophagectomy in, in North America was really first performed by Lee Swanstrom, who you heard earlier today and he did the transhiatal approach, and then popularized by Dr. Lukatich in Pittsburgh. He did a prospective multi-institutional phase two trial. So this was a randomized trial here in uh, North America of 104 patients 
just showing feasibility and safety of a minimally invasive approach. And if you see this trial, you think, wow, 2015, very different from how we're treating people today, right? So only a third got neoadjuvant, 90% of people I see get neoadjuvant. They were very early stage, and 10% of patients had high-grade dysplasia. That's very unheard of now. Now we have so many advanced treatments for high-grade dysplasia, these people are rarely getting esophagectomy. So, but what they did show is that it had good uh, surgical margins, a great lymph node dissection, so it was safe and feasible. And we've seen multiple, now two randomized controlled trials showing minimally invasive esophagectomy may be superior to open. So the time trial compared about 50 open to minimally invasive esophagectomies. What they described as minimally invasive was a right vac in the prone position in the laparoscopic belly. And the minimally invasive surgery had a lower respiratory complication rate and no difference in overall or three-year survival between the two groups. And then a lot of people are familiar with this publication. This was from the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a multi-center trial with 207 patients. The open group was a thoracotomy and laparotomy, but the minimally invasive was a laparoscopy and a right thoracotomy. But interestingly, the minimally invasive approach still had significantly lower major um, and uh, post-operative complications with no difference in overall or three-year survival. And there's been going on for plethoras of data showing that minimally invasive is probably better in the short term as far as respiratory complications and having equivalent long-term survival. So why is it better? Um, because uh, minimally invasive surgery has potentially no ICU stay, no thoracotomy, decreased OR time, blood loss, shorter hospital stay, maybe a better lymph node dissection. And these patients were able to get to adjuvant immunotherapy quicker. So immunotherapy for esophageal cancer was really just approved in April of last year. Um, and almost everybody, that's pretty much 80% of the patients we treat with esophagectomy will go on to get um, adjuvant immunotherapy. So the reason I think there's been some challenges converting from open to minimally invasive, there's some preconceived notion that open, you know, is a better oncologic operation. And then I think the real truth of it is it has a variable learning curve. And this has been described as up to 175 cases. And for an esophagectomy, if it took you 175 cases to be proficient, that could be your career. Um, but I think some of this is maybe overstated and kind of is a little more outdated. And this can be shortened with good society courses. There's some really good clinical how-to videos. Um, and we have some good videos on the Forgot Journal um, uh, uh, website itself. So the, as far as lymph node dissection, the, the classic best operation is a transthoracic on block, but I think we can get there with robotic and minimally invasive esophagectomy. There's reports up to greater lymph node dissection rate than on block. So I do my esophagectomies robotically for a couple of reasons. So like you heard this morning, this is a really nice setup. It's ergonomically better. So I'm sitting down doing a lot of my operation. My shoulder's not sore at the end of the day. I can use ICG more smoothly. So I can just push a button and it works. I don't have to get a new camera out, do a whole bunch of other things. So I can use that if I need to look at the gastrocolic, if I want to see what my conduit looks like. And you can get a really good high mediastinal dissection, which I think helps get you those lymph node rates as high as you could get for an open on block. So this is my port placement for a robotic esophagectomy and it's kind of been in transition. So I put my first port about 12 centimeters down from the xiphoid. Um, goes six centimeters, two on the left side, one on the right side. And then I've recently started putting my liver retractor down lower in the right lower quadrant. And that's because if you've done, you know, like robotic parasophageal hernias, sometimes that Nathanson liver retractor can get bumped by the elbow of the robot. But this way it completely stays out of the field. So I have it here in the very bottom corner, completely away from the robotic arms altogether. And so I'm gonna take you through a brief video. Um, we'll do a seven hour esophagectomy in six minutes. Um, so, so I think crucial when I'm talking to my fellows about this, the first thing is you gotta make sure someone's resectable. So most people are getting neoadjuvant therapy, so you gotta make sure the esophagus is not stuck to the aorta. So I start on that right cruise, and I make sure that, that the esophagus comes away from the aorta and it's not invading there. And then I quickly go to my media, the media sound section, which is probably my favorite part, and why the robot is um, really helpful here, you'll see in a minute. You're making sure to keep all of those lymph node bearing fatty tissue down with the specimen itself. And then you can take this robotic um, camera and go really high up into the mediastinum. And what you do is you stay right on the bottom of the pericardium. So you're keeping all of that lymph node tissue down. 
you're going to go all the way up until you see the airway. So you want to see the subspinal lymph nodes. You'll clearly know it when you see it. Um, and you can get up higher here, make sure you see the carina itself. And all this will make your chest dissection go very quickly and ensure that all of your lymph nodes stay with the esophagus. So in a second, you'll see that lymph node come into place. And you know if you do a lot of chest stuff that the lymph nodes in the chest are so nice because they're, they're black, so they're very easy to find compared to the, the fatty lymph nodes you see in the belly. So here you can see the subcrinal lymph node, and you can see the cartilage of the carina coming down right below there. So after um, I make sure I go really nice and high up top, then I go down below, and I want to get all of that lymph node bearing tissue up off the aorta and stick and stay with the specimen. Again, this is how I think you get these better lymph node um, dissection rates than, than they do with a, a transhiatal or other approaches. So here I'm keeping the aorta, um, just staying right on top of the aorta coming on up. And if you can do a lot of dissection on the bottom and on the left side, then when you flip to go into the right chest, you'll have a much easier time and it will take a very short amount of time to completely free up that esophagus. So this I think is a nice view of the aorta as you're coming up here. And I started using the um, SynchroSeal, which is the energy device I'm using here. And that's because it's bipolar and seal, so it, I feel safer using that around the airway. In the early um, reports of uh, robotic esophagectomies, there were a lot of airway injuries, which can lead to tracheoesophageal fistulas. So a lot of that was just a harmonic. And then you want to make sure you bring up all that lymph node tissue as you divide. This is the left gastric artery and vein. Here I come down at least two, usually three or four vessels on that lesser curve and divide that lesser curve fat here with the white loaded with stapler. If you're gonna be doing an Ivor Lewis, you're not going all the way up to the neck, you can come down even a little further on the lesser curve. I think with an Ivor Lewis, you can definitely get a lot better um, uh, distal gastric length. And then I make my conduit. So I make about a four centimeter conduit. Um, and the key, this step here is what I think helps straighten it out. I take the tip up, I hold it all the way up at the left diaphragm and take my other grasper and pull it straight down. So you straighten out that conduit. Um, and you make a nice four centimeter conduit here. I didn't show taking down the gastroparesis, but you see a lot of videos lately of sleeves and stuff that kind of you know, simulate what you do to take down the, the vessels on the greater curve. So after I do this, I then re-suture the um, conduit back to the specimen so that when I pull it up, it stays in a nice straight line. And I'm gonna staple or suture the staple line to the lesser curve so that it stays in the orientation I want it to when I come into the chest. So you'll see it there. And then we're gonna go into the chest. So you can see all that hematoma there. So basically the chest dissection is almost done, right? So then we take down the um, interpulmonary ligament. And I skip here to the anastomosis because I think that's probably the next critical portion. So there's a bunch of ways you can do it. Um, I've started using more of the 28 millimeter EEA stapler. That's this one. It's a little larger than 25. There are times you'll have like a small, I had an 81 year old lady a couple of weeks ago, very tiny, I couldn't get this in. So then I used the Orville, that's 25 millimeter stapler. It's a little smaller. You can also do what some people refer to as the modified Oringer, where you staple the back layer and hand sew that front layer. Um, if I do the 28 millimeter, I do two purse strings around there to get a nice tight purse string around that Orville grasper. And then I think another critical step is here, as you're pulling up the conduit, you have to make sure that that staple line stays on the diaphragm and you see that fat coming up. That way you're staying oriented, nothing's getting twisted. And then you drop it down so the staple line's staring straight up at you because you have the right chest up. So you wanna make sure that you're completely oriented. Reconnect them here with the EEA if you've used that before. And then, again, when you're keeping this oriented, you wanna take that last, um, last portion there with the stapler along the same stapler line so that they don't cross um, to keep that nice and straight. And so then after this, I'm gonna just over sew the pleura on top. You wanna keep your anastomosis underneath the pleura. I think that helps protect it in case you were to have like a microscopic leak. You have something kind of overlying it. This is where if you want, you can bring up an omental flap and really flap it around the anastomosis there. Um, I don't often do that unless there's something I'm worried about when I'm in the belly, um, just because it's a lot of bulk to actually bring up through the hiatus. Um, so I close this here, and then at the end, what I'll do is I do cryoablation in the chest. I think what helps with pulmonary complications is really good pain management, and I, if you're gonna do a belly and a chest surgery, I think doing the cryoablation helps decrease the, the pain, at least in the chest. Thank you.
tweak that a little bit. So I do the cryoablation from the intercostal four through eight um, nerves. So again, I think the key steps for a mediastinal um, esophagectomy is a good curl mediastinal dissection, so getting all that lymphatic tissue down with the esophagus, doing this sort of on block as much as you can. Dissection of that gastropapillic artery, you can use ICG to help you. Um, if you, this is a time where if you want that omental flap, you can harvest that at the same time. Doing a good left gastric artery dissection, getting all that lymphatic tissue up with the left gastric artery, so getting right down near the celiac. And in the right chest, again, avoiding airway injuries. That was a big flaw when people started doing minimally invasive esophagectomies, so just being really cognizant of your heating of your energy device and the carina. And then your anastomosis. Um, everyone, it's a very critical portion. Everyone does it just a little bit differently, but I've had really good success with this uh, stapler. So some areas of controversy. I don't do a pyloric intervention um, anymore now that I do the minimally invasive Ivor Lewis. And I think, you know, there's probably, if you do a pyloric intervention, you're gonna give about 15 to 20% of people uh, dumping, and I don't have a good way to treat that. If I don't do a pyloric intervention, I'm gonna give about 15 to 20% of people gastric outlet obstruction, and we do have good ways to treat that. So if you're not gonna do a pyloric intervention, you should pair with a good GI doctor or yourself know how to do a GPOM. Because I think GPOM after esophagectomy works very well. It's unlike the get like gastrophoresis we talked about this morning where you're not really sure. This is like, you know the problem. It's very, it's a mechanical problem and doing a GPOM will ensure success in a very high percentage of the time. I don't address the hiatus. I don't go back to the belly to close it. Um, I think that's a lot of extra time, and I haven't had a high rate of um, hernias after mediastinal dissection. Um, and in, in my experience, I do think it's actually fairly easy to fix those robotically, so I don't think it's too, too big of an issue to not close it. Um, you can do your anastomosis anywhere you want in the, I mean, in the chest or the neck. I think you're gonna fool yourself if you think you can get above 24 centimeters in the chest. So if you have a tumor above 30 centimeters in the esophagus, you should, I will go up to the neck to do my anastomosis. Because um, I think you think we're getting really high in the chest and then you do the scope afterwards and you're always a little bit disappointed when you're like, oh, we're only at 24, I was so high. But, and then we're gonna see a lot more of this next issue, the reoperative um, field. So particularly after sleeves, so we know there's a lot of bariatric patients getting sleeves, and what happens when they develop esophageal cancer is a GE junction after a sleeve. Um, so there are some interesting reports of left gastric embolization. Daniela Molina wrote a really nice article about that that's in um, one of our foregut issues um, that you can take a look at, um, and she had success with that. So I think it's gonna be something that we're gonna have to um, learn what to do with. So she was able to do that. If you can't do left gastric artery, artery embolization, you'll have to do like a colon interposition or a small bowel jejunal interposition, um, which is a whole nother uh, discussion. And then we're gonna start seeing a lot more operation after immunotherapy. There's a large group of patients that are in the neoadjuvant trials. Um, so I haven't seen any, but soon we're gonna start seeing these people that got neoadjuvant chemo, radiation, and immunotherapy, and they're gonna come to esophagectomy. So it'll probably just be some new challenges that we see. Um, so just being prepared for those. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker um, is Dr. Red Fell, who needs no introduction. Um, he is going to enlighten us about whether or not GERD and EOE are truly mutually exclusive entities. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know how I got roped into this Prakash or Tom. <laughs> Uh, because uh, the, the riddles of EOE and GERD are especially uh, confusing um, for the confused surgeon. Uh, most of the time when the surgeon hears there's gonna be a talk on EOE, this is kind of their response. Um, and probably if GIs are out there and they hear a surgeon's gonna talk about EOE, they probably their response too. Uh, so uh, when I started uh, looking at this, um, I realized the surgeons maybe ought to wake up because at the very least, the first description by a, a VOE was actually by a surgeon. Um, uh, Steve Atwood in 1993, working with von Demeester, who described patients who had no evidence of GERD but high eosinophilic uh, counts on their biopsies and evidence of stricture and so forth. Uh, part of what I think we try to do with uh, AFS is, is we both have beliefs that we think are absolutely true, and I think we've realized that it's really the melding of these two that maybe comes closer to the truth over time. 
although I don't know that I'll come to any closer to the truth today. Uh, because when I started looking at this, I realized there were all these different acronyms and, and things like peroxidase, MIP-1A, stuff that I'd never heard of. This alphabet soup, however, did spell out one thing to me, and that was help. <laughs> and, and so I called up, of course, one of the people who's very knowledgeable, incredibly knowledgeable about uh, EOE, and that's Stu Beckler. And so I want to thank Stu and Evan Bell and, and others for their input on this because, uh, frankly, I had no clue what I was talking about when I started this, and I still may not. Um, but we do have some differences in perspective, and maybe that difference in perspective will at least raise some research questions, if nothing else. So historically, from 1990 through 2006, it was pretty much thought that these two were distinct entities in the sense that any uh, patient who had eosinophilic esophagitis that did not respond to PPIs um, was true EOE, and that patients who responded to PPIs or acid suppressor medication had to have essentially GERD as the background. And, and there were a number of reasons for this. Basically, the thought was the only thing that PPIs can treat is GERD. Um, and then in 2006, Noah and his uh, colleagues uh, found that there were some patients who had no evidence of GERD, but they did have eosinophilic esophagitis that responded to PPIs. And what they did is they actually studied patients prior to PPI therapy, amazing, um, and found that the symptoms and endosc endoscopic and uh, histologic findings between PPI responsive and PPI non-responsive EOE were essentially the same, and it was about the 23 to 61% of patients who had PPI responsive EOE and no evidence of GERD. Uh, and so this raised the question, now thinking e uh, PPI responsive EOE, no longer a subtype of GERD, maybe it's a subtype of EOE, or maybe it's just a distinct entity. And th that went on for a number of years, recognizing that even though there were some similarities in adult patient presentation in terms of overlap of symptoms of heartburn, dysphagia, and non-cardiac chest pain, that by and large these were two different uh, patient phenotypes. The younger male with a history of atopy um, would present with uh, food impaction and so forth, and endoscopy looked different than the classic GERD patient. So in that time frame, PPI responsive EOE was kind of classified diagnostically um, as part of EOE, but on the pathophysiology side, it wasn't really clear how, um, the, how could PPIs affect eosinophilic esophagitis outside of controlling acid. So since 2017, we kind of recognized that, that EOE and um, GERD kind of coexist more often than we've realized. But recognizing those kinds of interactions historically, we've, we've sort of come up with four possible scenarios that relate EOE and GERD. Uh, eosinophilia can just be a marker of GERD, and these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Uh, GERD and EOE could coexist, but be unrelated pathophysiologically. EOE can contribute to or cause GERD, or maybe GERD contributes to or causes EOE, going back to the very first uh, sort of thought process. So eosinophilia can be a marker of GERD. Um, and before we go there, I just want to backtrack a little bit thinking pathophysiologically and ask, to what degree is EOE a response to local or systemic factors? And it's something that hasn't ever really been clearly elucidated. But I, I think the thought process, as far as I can understand and gather, is that there's probably an immediate contact allergy, like getting <coughs> poison oak on your skin. Um, and it's not just a re systemic response that's manifested for whatever weird reason just in the esophagus. And this was a little, took a little time to get across in terms of the fact that, that rapid transit through a tight syncytium was thought to make it very difficult for food antigens, which are bigger, to get through the uh, esophageal mucosa. But Dave Katzka and his colleagues then demonstrated that in biopsies of esophageal mucosa, patients with EOE who had been exposed to protein, uh, uh, milk, and gluten antigens a few days before still maintained, ma maintained those antigens in the esophageal mucosa on biopsy, again suggesting that it was a local uh, rather than a systemic reaction. And the recognition that EOE is patchy uh, probably follows what we see on a barium esophagram where we realize that barium coats 
the esophagus kind of differently. So there probably is a patchy nature to it that again argues that this is an immediate contact allergy. So if that's the case, then do we need a vulnerable mucosa for EOE to develop? And this is Dave Katzka, one of the other prime researchers in EOE, uh, stating in the paper that I just quoted before that the esophageal epithelial area function is per perturbed in patients with EOE when it's active. So it probably does require this, or at least it's a very frequent finding. Now dilation of intracellular spaces, is a, intercellular spaces, is a histologic hallmark of EOE, but it's also a hallmark of GERD, and we're going to come back to that later. So if we have to have a vulnerable mucosa for EOE to develop, what can lead to a vulnerable mucosa? Well, we know that acid can, or we think acid can. Can allergens themselves lead to it? Uh, how about gastric juice regardless of acidity? So let's look at the acid stuff. And this is from um, Nakua Hirano and people at Northwestern. Just a very simple diagram saying that in the normal situation, the permeability of the esophageal mucosa is very poor, but you get acid exposure, you get epithelial barrier injury, and suddenly antigens can get through and they trigger this whole cascade of stuff leading to eosinophilic uh, inflammation and a bunch of other alphabet soup for me about how that happens. It will always remain alphabet soup for me, I'm sure. Um, GERD and EOE maybe coexist, but are unrelated. And so for that to happen, we'd have to have an acid independent activity of PPI. And so it was kind of discovered that in vitro, PPIs would directly inhibit the Th2 cytokine stimulated secretion of eotaxin three. That's kind of the final pathway in all this that happens if you get acid induced injury. But also there's some other alphabet soup about how it works. These have been all really primarily in vitro studies. However, PPIs are prodrugs that require activation by acid. And so kind of like a certain terroir of good wines, it required a certain microenvironment in the esophagus to activate those. And, and so various mechanisms were proposed for that. Again, proposed, not ever clearly elucidated as far as I can make out. Now, the second thing that would have to occur is that these two should seem to be randomly not interconnected. And, you know, GERD is common, and so it'd be not uncommon for EOE patients to have GERD as well. And about 20% of Western adults maybe have GERD, at least at one point in their last two weeks. Um, but abnormal reflux has been found in 42 to 56% of adult EOE patients in small studies, and up to 70% in one study in which looked at endoscopy and pH findings. And now that could be selection bias because the prevalence of GERD in patients undergoing EGD may be higher than 20%, but it's probably not 56 to 70%. So that suggests that this sort of totally separate scenario probably isn't very likely. So could allergens themselves be what's leading to a vulnerable mucosa? And, and this is one I really haven't seen much research on. It's true that the IL, whatever it is, eight or 13 or whatever, is kind of a mediator that can be blocked and help, and that's actually how the, the new uh, monoclonal antibody helped uh, treat EOE. But it's not clear how allergens themselves could do that. Now, maybe you don't require a vulnerable mucosa for EOE to develop. That's the other possibility. And in fact, in the study that I quoted earlier uh, about looking at milk and gluten antigens, um, Ravi and his colleagues found that actually some other allergens could be ingested as it were through the esophageal mucosa in normal individuals. So maybe that's the case. And again, we don't know, but this is sort of the other part of it. So EOE, does it contribute to or cause GERD? Well, we know that eosinophils release myoactive substances that relax the LES and that EOEs create dysmotility because of the inflammatory changes that they uh, occur, that occur with chronic eosinophilic esophagitis um, and a whole bunch of alphabet soup too. But GERD is a lot more common 
and we've got a lot of other mechanisms for GERD. So I don't think there's a lot of enthusiasm for thinking that this is probably what's going on. So we come back again to kind of where I started out, and that is that GERD contributes to or causes EOE. And again, as I mentioned before, normal esophageal mucosa is impermeable to large molecules like food allergens in the three to 90 kilodalton range. But if you put acid and pepsin together in a rabbit mucosa, it starts to leak. And, it can, and these food allergens can get through. And also there's mast cell products and other stuff that I won't pretend to understand going on that uh, leads to all this, this alphabet soup again for me. And it turns out that most patients who have PPI responsive EOE do have GERD, or at least a large number of them. In Molina's study, 35 patients who had EOE, 55% um, of them had a uh, history of allergy, so atopy, but 82% of them had actually evidence of GERD by endoscopy or pH. And if you had, if you had an abnormal pH, you had a really high chance of responding to PPIs. So again, it's kind of shifting back towards that question. Another study by uh, uh, Goes and colleagues looking at patients who had sort of distributed EOE limited to the distal esophagus versus extensive esophagus. And, and again, maybe suggesting there are two different entities to a certain extent, or at least in some patients, found that PPI response was much higher in patients that had eosinophilic esophagitis limited to the distal esophagus. And larger studies have shown a histologic PPI response in, in 33 to 18% of patients who had normal pH studies, but 82 to 100% in patients with abnormal pH tests. So again, suggesting that this PPI response is the primary mechanism may well be GERD. And, and so then the question comes up in that non-acid related PPI response of EOE, is it because we're not detecting GERD or something else is going on? And uh, Stu Speckler said, yeah, it's possible patients with PPI re response of e uh, eosinophilic esophagitis simply have GERD that's not detected by conventional diagnostic tests, but the benefit from acid suppressive benefits of PPIs rather than it being an independent mechanism by which PPIs work. And we quote often that pH testing misses GERD in up to 25% of patients with other objective findings of GERD. But those are mostly 24 hour transnasal studies. And we know that doing Bravo testing, that sensitivity increases dramatically. So one of the things that I've noticed during my time doing endoscopy is that it, it sort of freaked me out at first, but I would have patients who had clear cut peptic strictures and their pH test would be normal. And, and I went, what's going on here? And, and I don't know what's going on, but we went and looked at our, at our series. And so we had 162 patients who had what looked like a peptic stricture, biopsies were negative for EOE, at endoscopy time, at when we placed a Bravo pH test. And it turns out, that there are a fair number of patients, actually perhaps up to 40% of patients, who had a normal pH test in presence of a peptic stricture. And what do EOE patients have? They have strictures. So maybe we're missing out, even with prolonged Bravo pH testing, on picking up on patients who have GERD in that setting. It also turns out that patients with EOE tend to be really sensitive to acid. And this was a study looking at time to onset of pain and volume to onset of pain, infusing hydrochloric acid into healthy volunteers. Sign off for that. Um, or patients with EOE. And it turns out that EOE patients are very, very sensitive to small volumes and small amounts of acid. So maybe most of PPI response of EOE should not be under the anti-inflammatory properties of PPIs, but back to GERD. Um, and I think Stu said it very well, without PPIs, distal esophagus is exposed to reflux acid for up to 5% of the day, even in normal adults. So maybe, maybe even in that setting, it's got something going on. So having a little difference in perspective, I'll just ask the question, if GERD plays a significant role in EOE, and even mild degrees of acid can elicit symptoms in patients with EOE, and thanks to Phil Katz's study, we know that even double dose 
Isomeprazole normalizes gastric pH only 80% of the time. And we also know from other studies that PPIs kind of lead to a leaky stomach. Might there be a role for, in some EOE patients, in which surgery, anti-reflux surgery, would lead to resolution of EOE? Not just resolution of their GERD symptoms, but resolution of EOE. It's a question we don't have any answer to. <coughs> so we talked about acid, allergens. How about gastric juice regardless of its acidity? Again, a little difference in perspective. GI colleague of mine I'd love to say, there's a lot of stuff in gastric juice other than acid that I wouldn't want to put in my eye. Um, and if any of you don't believe that, I invite you to vomit and then put it in your eye and let me know. Um, so it raises the question, in a sense, we'll get into this, could GERD also be a factor in non-PPI responsive EOE? And it gets even more confusing because there's this caviar story and uh, I'm sure that a lot of you regularly eat royal beluga caviar. Um, but in 2002, Eva Enters, my our colleagues in Vienna, reported a patient who developed anaphylaxis to beluga caviar, poor soul, a food that was previously not known to ever cause anaphylaxis. And um, it turned out that the patient was taking acid suppressive medication for gastric ulcer. And so she thought, gosh, I wonder if there's a connection. And so she did some studies on <coughs> IgE levels in uh, 152 outpatients with no history of allergy and they were treated with uh, H2 blockers or PPIs for three months. And interestingly, these patients started developing some food specific antibodies. Turned out also that PPIs increased gastric permeability. Now, for any of you who have been to Hawaii, this is just a perfect reason to say, PPI suck, <laughs> at least if you're into beluga caviar. Uh, but it raises a question about PPI non-responsive EOE and GERD, and that is, to what extent does the non-acidic stuff in gastric juice affect the esophageal vulnerability to, to allergens? And in GERD, with or without EOE, does normalization of esophageal pH on PPIs always result in return to a normal intercellular spaces? And if not, why? Is there other stuff in gastric juice, bile-activated pepsin, et cetera, that is difficult to normalize? How about anti-reflux surgery and EOE? Well, I'll just say that it hasn't had a great history in the past, except for four patients in the literature that I can find that had a fundus lactation and did well. Our personal experience in patients that had EOE on biopsies uh, was this was 39 patients we operated on. And by and large, dysphagia was not a big issue afterwards, although in some patients it was. And these were not necessarily the patients that the GI see in the specialized clinic who have a stricture down to pinpoint. These were patients who oftentimes just had, it may be just GERD-induced eosinophilia. I don't know. But a question from the surgeon, are we missing opportunities to improve EOE in certain individuals who have EOE and GERD? Patients who reflux antigens more on PPIs, like Stu suggested. Patients who reflux antigens with ongoing gastric acidity that's pretty mild. Patients who have ongoing weakly acidic reflux as these EOE patients are more sensitive to reflux. Patients who have achlorhydria on medication, but in whom other elements of gastric juice create this vulnerable mucosa. And, and so a research question I'll summarize here is patients with EOE and objective GERD, um, Take a patient like that, biopsies show a dilated intercellular space, you treat them with PPIs, they're, they're achlorhydric, biopsies or maybe mucosal integrity still consistent with EOE. Theoretically, EOE is the source of persisted dilated intercellular spaces, allergens are causing that for whatever reason, or non-acidic GERD is causing persistent dilated intercellular spaces. To me, those are the two potential theoretic options. So how could we deal with this from a research perspective? Maybe treat with oral steroids in addition, reevaluate to see if they're by histology or MI mucosal integrity, there's still evidence of EOE, suggesting maybe it is gastric acid, or maybe we do anti-reflux surgery and reevaluate the neosin. So in conclusive conclusions, EOE probably requires a vulnerable mucosa, but it may not. Vulnerable mucosa most often is due to GERD, but maybe requires other things other than acid. 
And even if acid suppression is adequate, there's still this other stuff that I wouldn't want to put in my eye coming up from the stomach. PPIs may have non-acid related activities, but we're unsure how that happens. And PPIs reduce acid and pepsin pathway, and that, that may increase the potential for EOE. But even PPI non-responsive EOE maybe could be due to GERD. So to quote Aristotle, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Um, but this is part of life and, and these different perspectives that we try to bring to it from uh, AFS. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Our next speaker is Dr. Jörg Zahetner, um, who is currently a professor of, of surgery in Switzerland, and many, like many of the speakers here, has also trained at USC. He is going to be discussing new technologies to stop reflux. Dear Chairman, uh, dear colleagues, thank you very much for the invitation to present uh, something new here. And we go right on the topic. Uh, that's my disclosure slide. So first I want to thank everyone here who is a surgeon and everyone who is a gastroenterologist for coming to this excellent meeting and for the organizers that made it really a success. And I want to share here a picture of my surgical team. And we include in our big group also a GI practice and one of my GI colleagues is here, Dr. Linus. And together we try to really focus on different areas and in some areas like reflux, we work uh, together as a reflux center. As we heard in the lunch talk, uh, whoever joined the lunch talk, that most surgeons do a palate approach. So if you're not using an implant in surgery, you do either laparoscopic Nissen or a laparoscopic tuple fund application or some kind of modification or some kind of partial fund application and that's actually the concept uh, that's most popular uh, in the US and Europe. We heard that also yesterday in uh, one of uh, Dr. Lippen's talks, this is the same slide, do medications stop GERD? And we know that if you do acid suppression, you can improve symptoms, but you're not changing the amount of volume, uh, the amount of reflux. And uh, that's then those patients that need surgical solution. So if you have patients with regurgitation that are not well controlled on PPI, we know that a surgical technique should be used. There is something new which is not FDA approved, I have to disclose. So it's a new approach from a company that's uh, now since four years on the market. And my experience started uh, two years ago. So when we think about the new technique, and we are tailoring, and I look on preoperative motility function of the esophagus, I look at hiatal hernia size, I look on symptoms, uh, then, then you have to have in your armarium of surgeries uh, a place where you think a new technology uh, will fit. And uh, we'll look at that later, uh, but first show me uh, what the reflux stop uh, is trying to achieve. So first we want to reposition the lower esophageal sphincter into the abdomen. So it's this, this principle of, you know, hiatal hernia repair, getting the LES in the abdomen, and then recreating this flap valve with a gastric or esophagogastric plication. And then an implant is used to basically hold that in position. And the idea behind it is that it keeps the LES in the anatomical correct position. The esophagus is not trapped or encircled. The food passage through the esophagus is not impaired. And you know, the hypothesis is that postoperative dysphagia and difficulty to pelts in vomit should be less than with the other available reflux techniques. It's a little silicon ball uh, or, or a tube made out of five parts. It's kind of a safety feature if migration would occur. So basically it's assembled on the back table with a vicryl suture that holds these five pieces in place. Then we see here, uh, the deployment tool. So it, we need a 22 millimeter trocar that we just placed for the deployment of the implant. And the implant is loaded into a tube that's then introduced through the trocar. Positioning and trocars are the same like in the Nissen or Tupe surgery. And uh, I will show you a video so you better understand 
how the technique is actually performed. Some of you might have seen a video outside in industry, uh, which is from our research fellow, and uh, that's another video where, where you see how we approach um, the idle horny repair and anti-reflux surgery with the reflux soft. So we also heard, uh, you know, heard earlier that you don't want to start depending on the size of the hernia, you start at the right bruise or you start at the two o'clock position to reduce the hernia shock, get access to the mediastinum. And in this procedure, it's essential that you achieve a good mobilization of the distal esophagus. So when we heard also yesterday about, you know, the rate of colis gastroblasty in some centers, and uh, some of you might remember, I worked seven years at USC and published about the colis gastroblasty with Dr. Benicher. So in some centers, there's a high rate of colis gastroblasty use. So if you encounter a short esophagus, that technique might be then contraindicated, and we'll, we'll talk later about when, when that could occur. You want to achieve enough esophageal length, and uh, we saw before the nice resection in the esophagectomy with the robot, so that might be something that uh, people want to use here as well. I'm, I'm not doing robotic surgery. I think I'm just faster with the laparoscopic approach, uh, unless it's a very large parasophageal hernia. So you free up the short gastrics. That's kind of essential for this technique. You need the floppy fundus later for positioning the implant. And once you have achieved enough esophageal length, um, uh, so you need somewhere around four centimeter without pulling on the esophagus, um, then you do the coral repair, which uh, we have seen different ways to do it, either with figure of eight sutures, flagets, or using mesh, but that's not the um, discussion in this session or talk. So I can fast forward the video, so we wait just a couple of seconds until that's done. So this is a gore suture I use here for closing up the hiatus. And you know, you might use two to three sutures. Sometimes you need an emptier suture. Those are basically those steps of the procedure are similar if you do a tupe, a Nissen, or a Lynx procedure. So I think the hiatus is closed uh, good enough here. And then you want to remove that uh, fat pad at the angle of his. That's kind of essential to see really where that angle of his is um, located. So then you place two suture rows. It's a uh, esophagogastric glycation, basically, where you start at the backside of the esophagus, avoiding the vagal nerve. And basically, those are the borders now. The posterior vagal nerve and the anterior vagal nerve are the two borders where you now start a suture line starting from the angle of his going up and maybe with three, four stitches, you create like a three, four centimeter uh, glycation, which is kind of the principle of recreating this flat valve. So the idea behind this technique is to use that, and that's what, what I did in the last two years, uh, have this procedure reserved for patients with a poor esophageal motility, where I would not do a Nissen or a Lynx, and where I have patients with preoperative dysphagia. So this is a, a repair which is not encircling the esophagus. The second suture row is taken now like one or two centimeter in front of the posterior suture row. And uh, what I learned here as well is you don't want to have uh, tension on the stomach, so you, you leave a little gap in between and uh, do one more extra suture on top. So you now continue to run that suture up. You can also do interrupted sutures. I think the V-lock here just helps to, to speed up the procedure um, by uh, doing a running suture and uh, just locking it at the end. And uh, the, the the VLOG might also be beneficial. It causes a little bit fibrosis and a better tissue 
connection here, then uh, signal switches, I would oscillate. So now, now as we have finished the esophageal gastric glycation, we're doing another suture on the top of the fundus. So that's a little bit tricky, maybe at the beginning to localize really where is the top of the fundus to now make kind of a pearl string first suture to create like a, a roof. And that's how the assembled reflux stop tube is then introduced and basically pushed up into this pocket. And uh, on the one hand you push up, on the other hand you want to make a loose gastric pocket where that implant then ends up being positioned. So you start from the lower end with the running sutures. It's again kind of a pearl string suture at the bottom. And uh, the reason I'm not closing this with single sutures, which is kind of the original technique which was um, promoted at the beginning of this technique, I'm doing a running suture with one suture up and with the other one suture going down is because I want to avoid any opening of the pocket like uh, it is described in this bariatric surgery is gastric glycation. So we never had an issue that the uh, reflux stop left that pocket. So once you have it basically nearly closed, you can remove then the deployment tool, which is basically it it's getting just retracted and you can then switch back this trocar to a five millimeter trocar and uh, close later on this incision with the U or six barcode suture or whatever you want. So here you see we remove the deployment tool. You can already see now the gastric glycation where the implant is, is more or less located. And uh, here I'm just finishing the other suture row going down, so I have like two suture rows uh, that uh, hold the implant inside. So you want to close up the hole from the deployment tool down there, and then that's it basically. So I think we can go forward, remove the easy flow, and um, just have some pictures here in case the video wouldn't have worked. So. Originally, there were like three so suture rows described, but I think two, two are enough. So you create like, a, you see a 90 to maybe 110 degree wrap. So this suture is just on the top, on the top at the end, we place one more suture. And um, we can go over that part now because you saw the video. And um, I wanna show you some, some details that we think are important. So what you really wanna, achieve is that the implant stays on top of the LES. Because if it would be in this position or this position, the whole, you know, plication could potentially be pulled up into the area of the hiatus and would cause a, a, a failure and, and reflux to occur. So we're working kind of, you know, trying to see which position we can radiolog radiologically then uh, define as optimal, acceptable, or where failure or an unacceptable position could potentially cause a reflux recurrence. And uh, you know we don't have data yet to show that a poor positioning would actually make a different outcome. So you see here different swallows, it's contrast enhanced, so you can easily see where it's positioned. And um, we do those on the day after surgery just to get a baseline and then at three months and one year as part of uh, an ongoing study. That's how it looks from inside, if you're curious how it looks. And uh, it looks like a sup supercosal mass and I'm waiting for the first GI doc to remove it <laughs> because <laughs> he might think it's a, a lesion. So the first results were done from a study which was a CE mark, a company driven study in Eastern Europe where they had 50 patients looking at baseline and six month uh, pH results and also the current HFUL results. And most patients have a really good initial outcome. For my patients, I've done now uh, 51. And what's the most surprising is 
is the dysphagia that's really, really low. And where, see I, where do I see now place for this technique? So I still think that I should stratify normal motility and impaired esophageal motility because I want to use each technique for those patients where they have the best fit. So the link system, as we heard since 15 years, first implant since 10 years FDA approval, I think it's still for me uh, an excellent surgery in someone with normal esophageal motility and a small hernia. And I see the reflux stop in my practice as something that I can use in patients who want the technique or who have an impaired esophageal motility or who have uh, preoperative dysphagia. So I've done 51 patients so far and we are working on the uh, th three month and six month results of the first 30 and 40 patients and um, dysphagia rate is low and I had only had uh, one patient with recurrent reflux uh, and it's the Achilles heel uh, in reflux surgery and that's the hiatal hernia repair and the hiatal hernia breakdown. So for sure in every of those procedures you see here, when you have a hiatal hernia breakdown, um, then the procedure uh, doesn't provide reflux control. So I think when you have a patient with impaired esophageal motility, uh, that's a good fit. We, we have some experience in large hiatal hernias where I've done it in 20 cases out of those 51 that had a larger hiatal hernia, but I haven't done it in very large or intrathoracic stomach. We show here the electronic poster of our first 10 patients where we did more or less a pilot study to evalu evaluate safety and feasibility, reproducibility of the procedure, and it showed a good outcome. So as a summary, it's a new technique, it's a new concept. As you realize, I'm not showing a lot of data because it's not out there yet. I'm working to analyze my own data. It's currently not FDA approved, so it might be in two or three years. The principle is repositioning the lower esophageal sphincter into the abdomen, recreating that flap valve and using that intraabdominal pressure to augment the LAS. And the esophagus is not trapped or encircled, so it's one of the procedures where you potentially think that postoperative dysphagia should be lower and the ability to belch and vomit should be less frequent. Thank you very much. Well, that was a great session. I think we have um, seven minutes to have questions. So um, come on up and I'm sure there's lots of questions that were that are generated from you guys. We heard Dr. Worrell, Worrell so tell us an update on minimally invasive esophagectomy, including the uh, now new routine use of, immun of post-op immunotherapy. Um, and she showed that there's a lot of promise for robotic uh, minimally invasive esophagectomy to achieve the same lymph node harvest as on block. Um, then we got a really refreshing review from Reg who reviewed the EOE and GERD. And I thought that was really kind of cool because he, accept, he told us that he's really not an expert at EOE. So he had a fresh perspective on the review of the literature, which I think was nice. And lastly, Dr. Zahetner showed us a really interesting new, new uh, thought to ponder in terms of surgical reflux control, um, where which the device stabilized the angle of hiss after the hiatal hernia repair. Very interesting, and I will leave it up to the audience. I see you're all over. So to get things started, I have several questions for all of you, but I'll wait till people get up. First of all, um, for you, do you, do, I noticed maybe you edited your film um, to not show an extensive celiac lymph node dissection, but are you assuming, are you proposing that with an extensive celiac dissection like, like the on block, and the mediastinal dissection com um, as well as with that, that's where you'll achieve those lymph node numbers? Or are you getting those numbers with sort of a limited celiac dissection, mm. like you showed? Yeah, that was pretty limited. And it depends, I mean, so I think you can still get those nodes, with, uh, most of them are in the mediastinum. I don't think in the end there's actually a, that many lymph nodes on the celiac for these patients. So if it's a true G junction, I'll do a more extensive celiac dissection but a lot of these are like mid-esophageal and I really won't, I'll do more that limited. Yeah, that's impressive. Tom? Hi, thanks for the great talks. It's 
I got, I got to start by commenting how great it is to see the USC gang up here and the Dr. <laughs> legacy living on. So I want to acknowledge Dr. Demeester for training all of us. Um, so a couple <laughs> questions. One for uh, Stephanie. To me, the, the obviously the world's going toward minimum invasive <coughs> esophagectomy. And uh, to me, the, the Achilles heels have been, and you alluded to these things, one is the learning curve. And that can be substantial. And hopefully that will improve as more trainees come out uh, trained in minimally invasive techniques. But that's something that's not accounted for in the studies because those are generally mature surgeons doing those sorts of operations. And the second one has been the rate of periconduit hernia. Uh, and you, know, you kind of alluded to that saying it's straightforward. The data would suggest the periconduit hernia rates after MIEs are around 15% or after open surgery they're closer to 1 or 2%. And sometimes those can be quite significant. So any thoughts about how to prevent those? I, you said you didn't suture the conduit to the hiatus. Have you ever thought about doing that through the right chest, just suturing the hiatus to the right cruise? Um. Yeah, so when I was learning it, that's how I did it, because that's how I was first taught. But I, you know, you're in the right chest. I don't think you're really in an anatomic place to really make a substantial closure for the hiatus, so I don't do anything. I know people will go back to the belly again and then reclose it. Um, but I do think it's a little bit higher rate, and I think that's just something that I, I take with it. Um, yeah, and I don't, I don't think it's worth spending another two hours to flip back to the belly to really get a good closure. And doing it from the right chest, I don't think really does much. Okay, and then Jorg, uh, thanks for some great videos. And uh, the first question I had when I looked at your technique is, how much do you think the implant really adds versus just everything else you're doing in that operation? And that's the first thing that jumped out in my mind. Exactly, that, that's the question that, um, that we haven't answered, you know? So it, uh, I, I, think, I think first, my, Anna, my, my approach to, to reflux stop is basically to first to, uh, you know, the first patient is kind of take the feasibility, you know, can I reproduce the procedure? Then look at outcomes. And then there is, there are centers in Europe that are doing basically the technique without the implant. Yeah, it's, uh, there are centers in Munich and Berlin who are doing these procedures without the implant. And, and I often see patients coming back from them with a, with a hiatal hernia return. So I think by positioning the LAS and the wrap that you created in the abdomen with that implant, that should avoid um, that the whole thing slips back into the, so you know, the, the problem with the Nissen and tube is often just a small hiatal hernia that you created, not a, a, a sliding hernia rather than a whole wrap going up. And I think by positioning the lower, uh, the lower esophageal sphincter really three, four centimeters lower down, that the implant here makes, makes a difference. But I assume you've never tested a control group who exactly. had everything else but not the implant. Exactly. Yeah, it seems to stabilize the whole unit, the whole yeah, reflux yeah. barrier. It's very interesting. But what I thought was, is there something we can use that's natural so that we don't have to wait for FDA approval? <laughs> Well, that was happens to be there. <laughs> if, if I recall, that was Altschuler's procedure, and, and which didn't show the longevity in part because of herniation. Um, so I, th I think that was, uh, I mean, so it's been studied before in that sense, but I think there's a need to bulk it or something. I mean, that was Nissen's ar argument is that the, the wrap, the bulk of the wrap stops herniation, which we know is to not totally true, but, but we still have to work in that, in that arena. Yeah, thanks. This is a great session. I really enjoyed all three talks. And Reg, I thought you did a wonderful job with <laughs> I enjoyed the, the uh, perspective on it. A uh, question I have, though, is something that I can't find much written about in the literature is if you have a patient with EOE and they require some kind of procedure, surgical procedure that's going to involve the esophagus, how much of a detriment is the EOE to the surgical procedure? I'm thinking specifically in myotomy because we see that uh, in achalasia, it's really not unusual to have eosinophilic esophagitis and EOE. And I worry about burrowing into that esophagus with a foam or even, you know, doing it from a laparoscopic Keller uh, procedure. Have you had experience with it or anything that you know about it? Yeah, I, I deliberately shied away from that because I've deliberately shied away from those patients. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I have seen patients who've had dense EOE down through the I mean, not only in the, in the LES, but in the body of the esophagus and clinical uh, 
eosinophilic type esophagitis, along with severe gastric outlet obstruction. And basically, we've treated them with PPIs and, and high dose <coughs> steroids and occasionally dilated them. And I think that's been kind of our, our first step because we know that the dilations, at least of the esophageal body, even though they look horrible, they don't, they don't actually perforate all that often. Um, so that's been my limited experience of somewhat less than 100. Stu? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I don't know if anyone else has experience to share with that. Um, please feel free to speak up. How about just with bundoplication, any reason? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, uh, as you saw from that graph, and I haven't analyzed those patients in detail, but a couple of patients did get worse for phase after a bundoplication. But globally, patients did well. So I think, and, and again, most of these patients didn't have the horrible furrows, rings, tight strictures that you see. They're probably more sometimes eosinophilic infiltration without severe esophagitis that we've operated on. So I think in, in those patients, we f at least I feel fairly comfortable if their dysphagia is not severe, if they don't have severe strictures, um, and especially if they've responded to PPIs in their EOE part, um, then I feel pretty comfortable doing them. And, and uh, you know, again, my series of less than, less than 100, I think we've rebiopsied two patients in whom the eosinophilia went away off PPIs afterwards. Um, so I think it's something to be approached with caution, but if they have a big hiatal hernia, Barrett's, other things that are going to lead you to think, and, you know, regurgitation or whatever, and you, you're thinking about operating on them, and their EOE is fairly mild in its extent, then I think they do pretty well. I think we have to wrap it up because we have the award session coming oh. up, but thank you guys all for some incredible talks. Good afternoon. I'm so excited to be able to open up this special session. What's really fantastic about a society that is growing uh, and having multiple annual meetings is the opportunity to actually award those who are doing exceptional work and exceptional things. And with that, it's my pleasure to, along with my um, co-partner, Mike Awad, to uh, open up the 2022 American Borger Society Award Ceremony. So with that being said, I'm going to bring to the stage um, Abe Khan and Roger Tatum, who are our co-leads for the Lifelong Learning Committee, and they're going to introduce a new award. So over this past year, the Lifelong Learning Committee worked together to create and define criteria for a new title within our organization, Fellow of the American Forget Society. This designation was created to recognize those individuals with a long track record of excellence in leadership and excellence in uh, foregut medicine and surgery. The limited number of those who will be chosen for this award will, uh, will exemplify the high standard to which we all strive to achieve, working collaboratively and remarkably within this space. This year, the inaugural inductees were selected based on their extensive contributions in creating this very organization. In future years, we will have an application process with defined criteria that will very soon be posted to the AFS website. And importantly, we do want to recognize and thank three of our committee members who did a lot of the research and work behind developing this criteria, Ben Rogers, Josh Sloan, and Afreen Kamal. And we look forward in the coming months for more applications uh, to be given to really have a new class next year in two 2023. But now we will hand it off to Drs. Bell and Carillas to hand out this year's class. Thank you. And to introduce our first uh, recipient, uh, our newest recent past president, Dr. Carillas, welcome. Thank you. It's, uh, it's really a great honor to do this. Uh, I give one of them. Um, so I'm going to give the first award to Reg Bell. He is the first fellow of the American Foregut Society. Reg, congratulations. If you listened, <laughs> if you listened to those criteria of being 
instrumental in forming this society. Let me tell you, nobody lived up to it more than Reg. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And, and you know, really, it's been a group effort. And, and we've all, as I mentioned yesterday, we've all gotten it together incredibly well. And I think it's, it's no one person um, who's done this. And so, Peter, the thank you very much for this. By the way, do you want a photo? <laughs> And, um, and so the second award goes, doesn't it go to Peter? Yeah, I'm giving it to Peter, I forget it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> second award goes to Peter Carillis, our past <laughs> president. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. And, um, and now I'd like to call up Trip Buckley. And in the process, uh, might as well line up the rest of the usual suspects. So, um, but Trip, again, um, we are honored to be able to present you with this. Um, just uh, you have done a fantastic job, um, including speaking your mind at times. <laughs> uh, so, I would, I would give my. Uh, my best uh, Peter Carlson impression because I thought the AC would be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Peter. Ready? Oh, hey, uh, Trip, just stay on the stage. We'll get a group photo afterwards. John Lipham, uh, whoever you are, um, none of us know you, so uh, I, I, I guess I'd better introduce you as, if nothing else, the comedian in the group. John, thank you. Good thank to you. be seeing the two of you. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. The big names. Cool. I get that too? Yeah, you get that too. You get that little badge at the end. Dan, Lister, come on up. Here. Dan, congratulations. Dan Lister. Thanks, Peter. Dan, thank you. Dan, you. <laughs> You've been just a yeoman in work, and actually, we owe uh, the AFS logo to, to Dan's work. So, Whoa, okay. really cool logo. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. And Felice. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Handshake, too. Okay. Keep it equal. Is this pin going to ruin my dress? Because I really. Uh, well, um, we could Good we could give you a little boa or something. <laughs> a little, uh, where's 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 that sash that you the had? Sash. We need that exactly. sash. Exactly, I yeah. need the sash. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you, bet. you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Mike. Mike Smith. <laughs> Okay, oh, a group photo. Group photo. Group hug. Group Aww. hug. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. All right, congratulations to our inaugural class of the Fellows of the American Forget Society. We have uh, very excited to present several more uh, recognitions and awards this afternoon. Our next uh, category is actually another new program for the society, which is the American Forget Society uh, Robotic Forget Mentorship Program done in collaboration with Intuitive Surgical. This is the inaugural class of the first four mentees who underwent a year-long longitudinal mentorship program, including case observations, uh, in-person mentoring and uh, remote telementoring. Uh, they all attended uh, the meeting uh, this uh, year and were recognized in a separate ceremony, but I do want to recognize, and I believe uh, we may still have one or two here. If you're in the audience, uh, please do stand up and be recognized. 
Yes. <coughs> Justin Henning, Adrian Martin, Matthew Musilak, and Josh Pfeiffer. Congratulations to you all. Our next award is um, from the, uh, it's a research grant award, and to actually present that award is Dr. Eric Congress, who's going to present the research awards. Well, um, it is my uh, privilege as the outgoing chair of the research committee uh, to be able to present the winner of the inaugural AFS uh, research grant. Uh, this year's, uh, the grant mechanism was created over this past year to foster collaborative research in the area of foregut disease and required both a surgeon and a gastroenterologist uh, to be named as co-investigators. Uh, this year's $10,000 uh, grant was sponsored by the AFS Foundation and it is hoped that through the uh, generosity of our members and uh, industry partners that in future years this dollar amount could go up or that more awards uh, could be uh, given. Uh, this year we had six great proposals um, that went through a blinded uh, review process. And the winning pr uh, proposal this year is entitled uh, Establishing the Optimal Endoflip Protocol, which I think is timely based on all the discussions we've had about endoflip and the techniques about how to do that. And we look forward to hearing the results presented at next year's meeting and ultimately submitted to foregut, both of which are required uh, for the award as well. So I'd like to uh, uh, invite uh, Dr. Hari Mahadev and Dr. Uh, Rasa Zarniger to uh, accept the award this year on behalf of the Weill Cornell uh, research team. So congratulations. <laughs> I'll try to catch it though. All right, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lee Swanstrom who will be presenting our next category, the Best Scientific Abstract Award. Welcome, Lee. Thank you. Uh, um, great, thank you very much. And on behalf of Mimi Canto, Mimi and I kind of ran the abstract uh, selection process for the last couple of years. Uh, it's fascinating uh, to look at all these abstracts, both from GI and surgery and kind of have a mixed group uh, reviewing them. It's fun to see what the GI community is doing. It's fun for the GI to see what the surgery community is doing. So it's uh, with great pleasure that we did that. So uh, you saw them uh, presented uh, yesterday and we had the research committee uh, grade them and rank them. And with that in mind, we were able to give uh, an award for the best abstract. It will involve a free registration to the Hawaii course and Jessica Wu was our winner. Once again, her abstract was on a large series of magnetic sphincter augmentation, and she did a very nice presentation. Uh, for our next awards uh, and award ceremony, um, we are going to be uh, giving the award for the Outstanding Trainee Award and uh, to, uh, for that, this is for residents or fellow trainees who are considered by their faculty and peers to demonstrate qualities as an outstanding clinician and educator. And uh, the award recipient for this year is Katie Galvin from the University of California, Irvine. a long walk. <laughs> she, she was nominated by Dr. Winman for this award.
right, our next category of awards is the Early Career Award. This is uh, to be awarded for an early career clinician scientist demonstrating excellence in scientific inquiry, including basic science, clinical translational, device development, or educational research. Uh, the awards committee uh, deliberated, we had many excellent uh, nominees, but we actually settled on three recipients for this year's Early Career Award. The first recipient is Dr. Shaheen Ayazi from Allegheny Health Network. Next recipient of the Early Career Award for an early career clinical scientist demonstrating excellence in scientific inquiry, including basic science, clinical translational, device development, or educational research is Dr. Dusty Carlson from Northwestern. Our third recipient is Dr. Picomol uh, Yerapino from Brigham and Women's. Congratulations. We'd like to welcome um, Drs. Uh, Carillas and Bell back to the stage for our next set of awards. Can we vote Shambo to who go first? I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there are some people that have just contributed tremendously throughout the years to, <laughs> to not only our community, but to medicine as a whole. Uh, and incredibly talented people uh, this year who, um, across both disciplines. Um, and the, the first awardee um, for this uh, involvement in transformational clinical educational research technological contributions in the field of Forget disease is someone who really should have been a surgeon, but he remained a GI. Um, and I think you all know who I'm talking about, Ken Chang. Uh, Ken has... Um, I, I forgot to bring a surgeon's hat, I'm sorry. Um, but Ken's contribution to interventional GI um, is just phenomenal. So his technical expertise, but also his willingness to teach uh, and his openness to change in ideas throughout time is just incredible. So Ken, can't thank you enough for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you. you get the switcheroo here that uh, Reg gave the award to a gastroenterologist uh, who he thought should be a surgeon. So I'm going to give it to a surgeon who, who should have been a uh, gastroenterologist. <laughs> uh, Lee, Lee Swanstrom. I don't think that... Uh, I certainly don't think Lee needs any introduction to this audience. I'd be proud to be a gastroenterologist. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. So there are so many people that make um, a production like this happen that we do not say enough thank yous to. And uh, we recognize that we could not do this without, without their enormous support. 
And with that being said, there are several people we'd like to say special thank yous to. The first of which is from Affinity Strategies. Uh, these are people that are behind the scenes. I'm sure you received countless emails from Rosalind Tully and Becky Sira, who just we would like to say a warm, warm thank you to for all the help they've done throughout the entire year, not just at this program. Thank you so much. And of course, I'd like to welcome our uh, program 2022 AFS program co-chairs to the stage, Dr. Tom Watson and Prakash Gayawali. You all have experienced over the last uh, two and a half days, I think what has um, clearly been the best program ever mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, AFS uh, history um, in a few years, but it's still the best. And um, it couldn't have been done without the tireless work of these two individuals through countless calls, meetings, uh, work behind the scenes. Um, please come forward. I'd like to recognize Dr. Tom Watson, Prakash Gaiwali for an amazing 2022 program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Prakash. And on behalf of Prakash, myself, the entire program committee, there's somebody that we want to give very, very special recognition to, and that is Kate Freeman. Kate, are you in the back there? We wanted to give you some time to walk up. Now, Kate is, her title is Executive Director of the American Forget Society, but that just doesn't do justice to all that she does for this organization. She's the one that really does all the hard work, makes our lives easy. She's Reg is better half, but by God, she, she takes all the work away from all of us and makes and, and does it all for the society. So she's the one tirelessly, tirelessly, all around the clock, 24-7, uh, 365, making it happen for the society. So, Kate, thank you very much for all you do. Well, um, we would just like to announce that it was an absolute pleasure to host this, uh, this AFS meeting. Um, next year, we are going to meet in Dallas uh, in uh, September again, Gaylord, Dallas. Uh, but we're not done with this program yet. Um, we have uh, one more session which will start um, at 3.30. And at 5, we have uh, a celebration um, we, we wanted to have it under the sun, but we'll do the next best thing. We'll go to the sun uh, auditorium down the hall because it might rain outside. <laughs> Apparently, they're going to be dueling pianos, and if people want to line dance, that's also going to be possible. <laughs> Adult beverages all around. Um, and tomorrow, we have uh, two courses left. We have uh, the flip course in the morning, the first of its kind. There's never been a flip-only course in the country, so the first of its kind tomorrow morning. And there is going to be the robotics course. There's still room in those courses. So uh, please uh, feel free if you, if you are able to and if your schedule allows to come to one or both. Or actually, you can only go to one, to one of these courses. And with that, um, we'd like to uh, thank uh, Felice and Mike for hosting the award, uh, the award ceremony. And uh, it's time to take a break. Uh, we'll come back in uh, 55 minutes. Refreshments next door in the exhibit hall. Thank you very much. Done. That is an unbelievable chord. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah.